actually coming in, but um, uh, we're kicking up this morning with Facebook, and special thanks to Facebook for sponsoring last night's reception, so much appreciated. <coughs> actually, yeah, 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 much appreciated. Um, and so I'll let you take it from here. Cool. Cool. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I'm Shreyas. Uh, I'm a production engineer on the product storage team at Facebook. And today I'm going to be talking to you about GF Proxy. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge the team that I'm privileged to work on every single day. And um, Lachlan, Rich, and David with us are here with us today. So a quick agenda about my yeah, talk. That you don't touch this. Oh, OK. Um, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the Gluster Native Fuse client, its advantages, its advantages, its disadvantages, and how we deployed in production. And then I'll introduce GF Proxy. I'll talk a little bit about failover. And then I'll touch on usage and performance, and hopefully have time for questions at the end. What? Put it on the other side. Rubbing on your jacket. Whoops. So, what are the advantages of the native Fuse client today? So, first off, it's a Fuse based driver. So, one of the things we've seen is that in production, it's very much less vulnerable to stuck mounts. So, with NFS, we see when an endpoint dies, um, mounts get stuck and IO hangs and there are these kernel bugs that we have to hunt down and uh, it's very difficult to manage in production. And we see that the fuse driver is not vulnerable to this, so that's a big advantage for us. The other thing is that it's in user space. So when we have to make patches to the fuse driver, um, it's easy to patch. We just install an RPM and then we re-kick the mount and uh, we don't have to reboot a machine, we don't have to install a kernel, so that's a big bonus for us. The other thing is that we have very good support for file locking with the Fuse driver. So we have customers that use the Fuse client just because they have libraries that call flock. And as you know, that's not very well supported with NFS v3. So they, by de facto, end up using the Fuse client. And finally, we see that um, because the Fuse client does file descriptor-based IOs, it's more efficient for write-heavy workload. So we see fewer syscalls at the brick than we do with NFS. So that being said, there are some disadvantages that make the Fuse client difficult to deploy in production. The first of this being that connections to all of the bricks in the cluster are established from the Fuse client. So on large clusters, we've actually seen like 10,000 or more connections per brick, which is very difficult to manage. Additionally, there are operational challenges with the Fuse client. Since uh, core parts of the cluster code like DHT, AFR, erasure coding are, are, are all done on the client side, when we make a patch, we have to go and track down thousands of clients in the fleet and upgrade every single one of them. So you can imagine that as a number of clients get larger and larger, this is like very difficult to maintain. And finally, if you're using AFR or even EC, there's the client-side network magnification. So let's say you're using a 3x replicated volume. The client only gets a third of the total available bandwidth because you have to make three copies. So these are kind of some of the sort of key disadvantages that make it difficult to go all out on the Fuse client and say we're going to deploy it everywhere. So I want to quickly go over the, a simple diagram of the Fuse translator stack. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. But you basically got the Fuse layer, you've got distribute, and then you have uh, replicate or disperse depending on the type of volume you're using. And of course you've got your client translators to talk, that talk to all of the brick servers. So this is like kind of the very basic Fuse translator stack. And so in order to address some of the challenges that we see with the Fuse client, we built something that we call GF Proxy. And what GF Proxy does is its role is to proxy FOPS between the Fuse client and all of the brick servers in the cluster. And so what we did was we removed the responsibility of DHT and AFR from the Fuse client, and we put it in a new server-side daemon that we're calling the GF Proxy server. And as you can see, what happens is the Fuse client gets very, very much simplified. You've got the Fuse layer and the client translator, which is configured to talk to one GF proxy endpoint, and all of the responsibility for distribution and replication is done on the server side. And of course, the GF proxy server is now responsible for talking to all of the bricks. So at scale, sort of a zoomed out diagram of this, um, you'll see we've got 
GF proxy servers that talk to all of the bricks. You can imagine we have two sub volumes in this cluster. And you've got multiple Fuse clients that are talking through each one of these GF proxy servers. And if, if, you've, if you've used NFS with Gluster, this is like very much analogous to NFS. You can just replace the GF proxy Fuse client with NFS clients and the GF proxy servers with NFS daemons. So this diagram should be pretty familiar if you've used NFS. So how does your proxy improve on some of the deficiencies of the Fuse client? So as you can see, we have a single connection to a GF proxy server. So now clients are no longer talking to every single brick in, this, in the cluster. They're just talking to one of the GF proxy servers. And when we make upgrades to DHT or AFR, we can do this on the server side. So we don't have to track down these clients unless we're making a code change in the client translator, which is not as often. We just have to update the GF proxy server and of course the NFS name is in the bricks and everything, but that's just like a server side change versus like client side changes. And finally, the clients don't do replication, so there's no client side network magnification on the client side. So based on the diagram I showed you, you'll wonder what happens when a GF proxy endpoint dies. So you have a fused client, you're mounted one of these endpoints, and it dies for some reason. You restart it, or there's like a network connection problem. What happens with what I've showed you is the client translator would get a disconnect event. And this would end up unwinding the frames with transport endpoint not connected. And any, as a result, any applications that are doing I.O. to the fuse mount are also going to receive this error. And obviously this is terrible, because if you're doing I.O. and you restart a server or there's some kind of unexpected failure, um, your workloads will all get interrupted. So if you do like some kind of maintenance, you're pretty much guaranteeing that everybody who's using you is going to be pissed. So in order to solve this problem, we built something called the AHA translator or the Advanced High Availability Translator. And the truth of it is that it's actually not that advanced and we put the name in there because AHA sounds better than AK. So that's really what that's about. Um, so the AHA translator sits between the fuse layer and the client translator, and its role is very simple. If an FOP returns with transport endpoint not connected, it will queue that FOP to be retried later. So it won't return that error up to the application. And when the client does reconnect with an endpoint, it will get a GF event child up, and we'll just retry all of the file operations in that queue. So when you do have some kind of failure event, the, the application just gets a brief stall in I.O. So it doesn't really know that an endpoint died, it doesn't get an error, it just receives a stall, and then after some amount of time, it just resumes all of the file operations. So I should amend my previous diagram. So the fuse client is not quite as simple as just the fuse and the client translator. You do have aha in there, but everything else is pretty much the same. So how do you use this thing? So it's, it's very simple. The GF proxy server starts with the Gluster D daemon. So there's no like additional work that has to be done to set it up. When you do a vol create, um, the vol files for the client and the server are generated. So um, what you mount it exactly like you would mount uh, a volume using Fuse. So you run mount-t, Gluster FS. You specify the host and the volume and the mount point, And you t give it a flag, which is dash O GF proxy that tells it to spawn a process that looks like this. And you'll note that the process is exactly the same as the fuse client process. Um, and the only difference is that there's GF proxy dash client which precedes the volume. And um, that tells the Gluster D daemon to um, like what vol file to serve. And so the client knows, uh, it gets the vol file and then just like spawns all the translators and you can use it just like any other fuse mount. So I want to touch a little bit on performance for GF proxy. So my disclaimer here is that we haven't done a whole lot of benchmarking um, and like performance testing with GF proxy. So what I'm really trying to get across in this slide is that we haven't really introduced a regression. So the performance is like exactly as we would expect with a native fuse client or an NFS statement. So the first slide, the first diagram um, to the left is a single stream test. So we've got in this case, in this setup, we have a 3x replicated volume. It's six nodes, so six bricks. And we've got a single client writing a four gigabyte file 
uh, to a GF proxy endpoint. Or in the case of NFS, you're talking to an NFS daemon. And you'll note that the throughput is pretty much exactly the same. Um, so the performance for, in this case, is gonna be uh, very similar. And on the multi-stream side, the test is that we have six clients writing a four gig file each, and each of the clients is talking to a separate endpoint. So we've sort of like distributed the load, if you will. And um, you'll see that the fuse, the native fuse client actually beats out both NFS and GF proxy. And I'm not entirely sure why, but I think you can chalk it up to the fact that there isn't that extra network hop where you have to, uh, the network hop and then paying the penalty of serialization and deserialization twice for all of your RPCs. And finally, uh, future work. So currently, um, plus the GF proxy only supports a single volume. And the reason for this really is because I got kind of lazy and I hard coded the port in the vault file. When you uh, spin up the client, it like talks to a default port. So what we actually need to do is integrate better with the Gluster D port mapper so that you can start multiple daemons listening on different ports for each of the volumes. And uh, also, I, I don't know who mentioned this, but I think there's a patch upstream for directory level mounts in the Fuse client now, so I'd like to like get that backported in as well. And finally, we are going to open source this. Um, really, the only blocker is that I haven't gotten single volume support, so I didn't really want to submit like a half ass patch, but um, if somebody wants to help me get multi-volume support, that'd be great. And that's it. I'll take questions. Yeah. File lock migration. What do you mean? So when a disconnect happens, it actually takes and removes all the locks, right? Not from the client <coughs> translator. Not, not from the fuse client side. Because the locking is happening at the GF proxy server layer, right? Like yeah. AFR is doing all the locking. Yeah, but, but when you do a uh, add break, the, the graph that has to change keys from the HD. OK. So that uh, the old graph connections have to get disconnected and the new graph has to come in. Okay. So as part of that, the lock should be relinquished, I guess. I think so. I haven't tested that particular case, so I'll I'll look at it. Yeah. Follow up question on that. So if the fuse client disconnects, then the lock cleanup should also happen. Then if the fuse client is never going to come back up, is yes. that related to the uh, lock revocation past the fuse? Um. Otherwise, we will have logs on the bricks. So I did some. <coughs> I've done some basic tests with it, like basically like holding a lock and then like killing an endpoint and then like having the client f fail over to another endpoint, and I think it all worked like fine with the existing code. So I didn't add anything else, but I'll have to do some more testing for that, I guess. Okay, so, so the new client will talk to the same uh, proxy server or different? Different one. Or it can be the same one. It just if depends it, on your if setup. If it's the same one, it will actually have the same connections to the brick, so it's probably fine. But I, I don't know. It probably, we probably need to see the code. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think what they're saying is like if AFR is maintaining a lock and you go to a different proxy server, it's a different AFR translator. I see. Process. Yeah, okay. So, so yeah. the locks are uh, stored on a connection ID base. Yeah. Uh, so if it is talking to a different GF proxy server, it's a different connection ID. Okay. I think the reason it works is because if that proxy dies, those locks are gone anyways. Yeah. It, 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 the process died, so there's FD cleanup on the. Yeah, side. yeah, but 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 it does not have the lock anymore. But the if if we don't tell the application that the FD is bad, it still thinks that it has the lock. Yeah, yeah. There might, we might have to like. Yeah, we'll have to do some work to get that. Sorry. But we have epoll threads on the client side and the GF proxy server side as well. <laughs> yeah, th there's some performance penalty there, but like the trade-off is like we use NFS in production all the time, and um, it's it should be like very similar to the issues we see with NFS, if you will. So. 
also on performance. You, you showed numbers for throughput. Um, did you measure latency as well using the proxy? Um, the latencies are very similar to like NFS latencies. But uh, like I said, I haven't really dug into performance yet. Like I literally just finished writing the code and we're like starting to roll it out in production. So yeah, what's up? IO stats in the client side uh, stack? Yeah, it can be. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's nice to get the stats all the way through. Yeah. So, because this is metering like NFS <laughs> yeah. clients over access, right? So, NFS client has good levels of uh, caching, caching yeah. and uh, <coughs> so you have plans for adding certain cache layers on the. Yeah, so one of the things we use is right behind because the right sizes are like 128K by default from the views. Sorry, I don't know why I keep doing that. So, so we buffer all the 128K writes up to like one mag and flush them down. And then there's like no reason why you can't add IO cache or any of the other performance translators. The diagrams I show were just like for simplicity because I didn't want to complicate the graph when I put it on the slide. So uh, another possibility that we might explore is trying to improve the efficiency of caching in the proxies uh -huh. so that a given proxy is favored for certain content. Yeah. Um, and we could probably pretty easily build the redirection logic into Haha -ha or somewhere else uh -huh. so yeah. that we don't have duplicate caching across a bunch of proxies for the same yeah. thing. Yeah. So how does it uh, know what all proxies are in there? Because at the mount point, I, I'm the for the amount, yeah. Uh, so the way we're using it right now is we have all our endpoints behind a DNS round robin. So there's like a vol option when you configure it, you tell it what the uh, DNS round robin should be, and then the vol file gets that in the remote host section of okay. of the client. But there's we're gonna add things like uh, adding the ability to add like a list of hosts in the vol options and stuff like that. So there should be like multiple ways to go solve that problem. That means it's currently not using the port mapper and the yeah. file is passed to the client machine. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so one thought, maybe I missed an important point here, uh -huh. but since I was uh, thinking about as, um, some vaguely related problems with, with Samba clients, uh, where we have a lot of, uh, in this case, issued API clients uh -huh. uh, for, for connections, um, and we have a memory problem there. Um, is it, would it also be, let's say, worth a thought of putting a proxy not on the server but on the client, so keeping the talking to different brick servers from the client, but then having one proxy instance here so that multiple mounts can kind of, with a very thin local protocol talk to that proxy server on the client, or does it completely miss your major points? Um, if, I think one of the main things is not having like important parts of the Gluster code like AFR and EC on the client side. So that, that I like actually, yeah. Yeah, so then we don't have to go and like upgrade all the clients. So mm -hmm. yeah. That's like one of the operational oh, challenges. Okay, okay. Yeah. So so hang on Billy. Oh. Okay. So uh, again it's related to the performance part. So when you say that there is an additional network hub what you have to have introduced, right? So have you have you thought about how it is going to impact the small file workloads? Well, it it will be worse than directly talking to the bricks, right? Um, you'll have, uh, like like I said, you'll have to incur that double deserialization penalty because you have to do it once on the server GF proxy server side and once on the brick side. So there there is a penalty to pay there, very similar to NFS. Um, but yeah, I, I need to run more tests basically and and like get those numbers. Yeah. So so uh, two questions about the uh, failover. So NFS server actually, when you uh, open a file with open, it doesn't actually send the open with open, and it is handled in the NFS server. So, uh, so even if you do a, a you know uh, a write, let's say the write fails with Pinarcon and some other, uh, and, and it retries, it is still the same write that goes on to the server. Uh -huh. But if you actually when you do an open, yeah, it goes till the brick. Yeah. So, so if you send uh, OAuth and write, yeah, and let's say it reads the brick, and then the GeoProxy uh, server dies, yeah, and now you actually uh, ta start talking to some other one, and it sends the write again, yeah, then you you may end up writing two writes, like like the same content you can write twice, okay, okay, 
so that is one issue and the second one is uh, it's the same thing basically what is it called the, the, the function which like I don't pretend it yeah so so the thing is if, if you send a MKD or uh, create yeah uh, it's the same problem so basically it, it, it hits the brick and then the server dies and then you fail over now the next MKD actually is going to give you exist as opposed to success of the MKT. Yeah, but we're only retrying if we get a disconnect from the the proxy endpoint, right? Exactly. Not from the brick. Exactly, you know, but that is the problem, right? So so the thing is, the fuse client talks to a uh, JF proxy server, which is going to send the MKD. Okay. And as soon as it sends the MKD, before the response comes to JF proxy, it dies. Okay. Now the fuse client has to fail over to some other JF proxy. And you, because oh, okay. JF proxy yeah, died, Give the inner con, so now it sends the MKD again. Now you will get an EA just as opposed to, you know. Uh, okay, yeah, I see. Okay, yeah. So um, these two are some edge cases we should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's yeah. yeah. probably extending the estimate, but uh, have you thought of thinified DHT on the client side just so that you can send requests more locally in the sense? At least one endpoint is a local thing. Because you have GFProxy running everywhere. Yeah. So put DHT where? Okay. So that you're not talking to a random GF proxy for a for every file. Right, yeah. To the, yeah, that's that's possibility, yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Like if we have performance issues we can look at doing that. Yeah. Yeah. At at least for the for the previous question for MKD and DHT, right? If you actually remember the GFID with which you are doing the create or MKD, yeah. even when the exist comes, if you, if you can send a lookup or something to get the GFID and compare it with whether it's the same or Yeah, make sure it exists. Not, yeah. Then you can send out the success yeah. and yeah. exist. Yeah. But OAP is a bit tough. I mean, it's not easy. Which is the almost think how NFS does it and kind of try to emulate that. Yeah. Because a lot of these answers will be like, yeah, but, but, but the thing, thing, thing with NFS though is uh, a NFS server kind of tells everybody that all the clients should talk to the same NFS server. So so the open logic, right, it is yeah. all maintained inside just one server, but it's not the same problem. There's, but you can do failover in it. Yeah, you could failover to a different yeah. endpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So you have similar challenges. Uh, we probably need to find that part out. I, th I think the entry entry creation part, I think it's easy to solve. Yeah. Uh, the uh, open drives probably we need to understand a bit about how NFS does it and do it now. You, you know exactly what I'm going to say. This sounds Viewer. like a bot. Yes, that, that, <laughs> exactly <laughs> what so I think there's another important point yes. to make to Shreyas is the reason you're getting peppered with questions that everybody's excited about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. And like, as soon as you're upstream, there are going to be so many passages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's show the appreciation. <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we'll do.